we're we're actually going to um, start where we left off last time. And um, whoops, let me do this here. And that is um, with this concept of heresy. Um, a lot of, of the readings that we had for this week, of course, was about uh, what uh, heresy uh, means to us today versus what it meant out of the early Greek and uh, Roman schools, um, which is, if you'll recall, it simply meant a choice or different schools of, of thinking or teaching. Um, the it, it, it was used, um, I, th I think, by Irenaeus first as meaning divisive, and then um, later on by uh, Tertullian to mean um, unacceptable, basically. You're not in. You're not in with the group if you, if you believe these things. So um, our authors... Uh, let us take a very strong stance on this and say heresy was a Christian invention um, that specifically Judaism um, allowed for different beliefs and um, that it held its communities together um, by um, basically requiring observation of the practices or orthopraxy. Um, if you're doing the right thing, that's all we ask. Uh, so uh, if you're following uh, the Torah and, and its rules, then, then that's good enough. Uh, the concept of orthodoxy went to know what you believe matters. Um, so that is where we left off. And we'll start today with... Um, and here's where I'm going to try uh, to go to, excuse me, my notes. Uh, Irenaeus uh, was a, a Greek um, who went to live in France at a fairly young age, um, was 18 or 20, when he witnessed the public execution of about 50 to 70 Jesus followers in what is now Lyon. Um, he was pretty horrified by that, and he believed that it was necessary for the people there to be more united um, and brought into one church. There were many different beliefs there, as there were in many towns. Um, so as, as you can see at this point, they did not require one way of thinking about being a Jew, uh, Jesus follower. Um, and he started using the term orthodox, which scholars believe in his thinking meant uh, straight thinking, uh, not so much as bad, but if, but if you're reasonable, um, this, is, this is the right way to think about it. Uh, and so he is actually the first one who identified the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, as central to uh, the teachings of uh, what Jesus uh, followers should believe, uh, as well as some of the Pauline epistles and some canonical works. And that's important too. We'll, we'll get into that later. Uh, one of those was the Shepherd of Hermas, which you might uh, recognize uh, from paintings. Uh, this is the story of the Good Shepherd, an image for Jesus. Uh, not all of the Pauline um, epistles were there. Um, and uh, Irenaeus's writings in a, in a, a, a book, uh, well, it, his writings are to oppose Gnostics. Um, and that encompasses a wide range of beliefs. Our authors are, um, uh, as you probably recall, are uh, very skeptical about his use of the term Gnostics because no one else called themselves that. 
And so they weren't that he was identifying them in that way, in a way that they wouldn't identify themselves. Um, so this, this term Gnostic uh, sticks, particularly in later times. Um, and as you know, it's still used today. So I, I borrowed here from um, Bart Ehrman um, to just give a view of, the, of what were four categories of these early Jewish Jesus followers. Um, the Ebionites, the Gnostics, which we'll spend more time on, the Marcionites, and the Proto-Orthodox. Um, First, uh, the Ebionites uh, was first applied by, again, Arrhenius in the second century. And um, we learn more about them later from Origen, who wrote that uh, Ebion signifies poor among the Jews, those who have received Jesus as Christ. Um, and we call them by this name. They believe that uh, Jesus was the Messiah because he was born Jewish, was righteous, and obeyed the Jewish laws. Uh, he, was, uh, he was born uh, a mere man, um, and not, not divinity, but he sort of earned himself that place by his uh, obedience to Judaism. And um, this group is what you might have heard referred to as Judaizers, those who are trying to uh, keep, uh, who, who believe that, that Jesus uh, was a Jew and, and taught within the tradition. Tertullian was the first to include them among the heretics, as he would say. Now, proto-Orthodox is a term that is, um, is debated a lot uh, because uh, at, our authors don't use it, and, and probably because they um, are strong, as you know, in their belief that these um, early uh, Jesus followers uh, were very diverse, and, and that was acceptable during these first two centuries. But it is important to understand that some of the scholars stretch what they call the early centuries, and ours are trying to be fairly strict in talking about the first two centuries. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, people lived uh, uh, in both centuries, uh, for instance, so there uh, might be, uh, including um, these uh, people we've talked about, um, Irenaeus and Origen, um, Tertullian too, I think. So at any rate, this uh, proto-Orthodox is, is the name for those who are starting to move toward um, a, or, or who desire greater unity. They're, they're just passing by. Okay. They're heading to the sanctuary. Okay. Okay. Um, and... Oh, crossing all the connection. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, do you want to say, is there something to, to hear? A little side joke to Tom. It's oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, welcome, Tom. Um, so, so Ehrman says that, that these are the ones who, who sought to stifle opposition, to stifle these, this range of opin opinions, and that and, and they called those who willfully chose to reject true belief heretics. Um, there are some um, like Ehrman who believe that this was very early, um, that it started, they, there were people who wanted, who believed there was only one way and they had the way um, from the first century on. Um, we'll be talking more about both the Marcionites and uh, the Gnostics coming up. So um, what is Gnosticism? These authors say uh, that it, it's, it's really a myth. Um, it's used to group people and that these texts are really nothing more than um, a variety of, of different views that have been lumped together in order to signify that um, they're not true 
uh, to the orthodox tradition that emerges. And they seize on a few of these. Um, and the authors, as you can see, are very uh, strong again in their in their uh, views about that. They, they, they said there are people describe them as a religion of body haters, people who believe that material existence is evil and that God cannot be known through the body. A religion of social deviance born of cosmic duality. Uh, this visible world was created by a lower God. It's bad, devoid of beauty, anything that reveals true divinity. And our job is to escape this world uh, through the acquisition of knowledge. Um, we must know our true divine essence, the knowledge of our true selves will free us. So they say, bas uh, basically, our authors say this, this, this was made up. There was no real practical Gnosticism. Other people don't have the same problem. Um, and it may be that they think the grouping of them is practical in that a number of them um, do reflect the central belief, even though there is diversity among them. Uh, Ehrman uh, describes them as a group of ancient religions, some closely related to Christianity, um, that say that uh, we get trapped in this evil world of matter. And only when we gain secret knowledge of, of who we are and how we can escape can we get out of this um, difficult existence that we're in. A couple of groups um, that did follow beliefs um, that would fall within this definition are the Valentinians and the Sethians. Uh, many were uh, followers of Paul as well. Many people claimed Paul. Okay, now, how many of you know Elaine Pagels? Many? Yeah? I know her work. <laughs> you know her work, right. Okay, so um, Elaine Pagels was a graduate student at Harvard um, about the time of the release, of the finding of the, the Nag Hammadi text, and uh, where, which, which are, uh, often talked of simply as the Gnostic Gospels. And she did her PhD thesis on that, published in 1979. And um, she uh, wrote a book that won the National Book Award and all other kinds of awards. She uh, continues to teach at Princeton um, and was uh, bestowed a, a National Humanities Award by Barack Obama just relatively recently. She's, she's fascinating on this subject, so if you can uh, have time to listen to her, uh, that would be good to do. Um, she, she finds um, a lot of meaning in the, in the term Gnostic. Um, and, and, and describes it as using the Greek word gnosis as not being primarily rational knowledge. And says the Greek language distinguishes between scientific or reflective knowledge, I guess that would be include analytical, and knowing through observation of experience. And she makes a distinction um, that it, this is could be called insight, involves an intuitive process of knowing yourself. And to know oneself at one's deepest level is simultaneously to know God. This is the secret of gnosis. And it is found in many of the um, texts that were found, including um, Beyond Belief, uh, which is her book on the secret gospel of Thomas. Could you repeat what you just said about what was the secret? Oh, yeah. Uh, that when you know yourself at the deepest level, um, you simultaneously get to know God. Now, when um, Pagel says that this, you know, the writings that are coming out now are really kind of third wave. Um, it, it, there was not a wide distribution of the Nakamati uh, texts early on because they uh, 
were controlled by the Egyptian government. And then there, were, there are stories about them being also uh, found uh, or in the hands of others who try to sell them. At any rate, the internet was not distributing them widely to the scholars. So there's been a lot of uh, time has, has developed insights into these texts. And as again, she calls this third wave, more information, including from other texts and um, insights and, and analysis from other scholars. Um, and, and she says a lot more um, is likely to be found. And so um, today she, her thinking has come to a, uh, wondering if if these Gnostic Gospels or the Nag Hammadi collection might be a better way to, uh, to describe them, um, are not really reflecting a lot of the Jewish mysticism of the time. Uh, she says she's, she's not sure um, and that, uh, you know, they may never know, uh, but perhaps future finds will uh, tell uh, more about that. At any rate, she was first attracted to them because there were many psychological uh, themes in the Gnostic Gospels, um, including what she said, what is hidden inside of you can save you if you recognize it or destroy you if you don't. There are a lot, people have, have used that theme in a, in a lot of different ways uh, over time. Um, if you want to understand what Jesus said, you must know yourself. It emphasized the wisdom knowledge of Jesus. Some said Jesus was never in human form. This again is the uh, one of the differences. And um, it they were attractive to women. I found this very interesting uh, because they tended to allow female participation in 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 rights. Um, so let, let me stop here and hear, hear from you. Um, I want to see if I can, I'm having a hard time following, here we go, following my cursor. So, thoughts, knowledge, wisdom from you um, and what you've known of the Gnostic Gospels uh, before this. Well, I'll make a comment. Uh, did you want to say something? Um, yes, yeah, so I was a little more on, I began to be more sympathetic to the position that the authors were taking of, of the fluidity. And while well, earlier I had said that they were followers of Jesus and therefore it was kind of splitting hairs to say they weren't Christian. I do see uh, what they're trying to say, and also this uh, this development uh, of heresy over the years. And I um, I don't know when the absolute uh, orthodoxy became um, real. Was that um, at the time of uh, of Constantine? Um, I think you've studied this, uh, Kate. Well, it, it certainly becomes more uh, uh, solidified at the time of Constantine because he wanted unity. He, he wanted to see orthodoxy. Yeah. If, yeah. It became kind of an imperial church. Um, so when I was in divinity school, um, we talked about the um, um, understanding of seven spheres that there was the seventh heaven is there were seven spheres you had to go through to reach the seventh heaven. And uh, I don't know how it ties into what the authors are saying, but there was a sense that you had to, you had to tr move through these seven spheres and it required a, a secret knowledge. And I know Augustine, um, you know, affirmed that um, Good. That was one of his contributions, and there was, and I can't remember the, what is the Middle Eastern view that has good and evil as two separate forces? I can't recall the name. Manichaeanism. What? 
Manichaeanism. So that was that was uh, prevalent. It's it's kind of prevalent throughout history. Um, so there's this um, there's this lack of orthodoxy and fluidity, and I think it's very good to cover that. Um, but there's also this um, when you take the meaning of the um, gospel. Uh, it's kind of counter to uh, the heresy is kind of counter to orthodoxy because orthodoxy requires a secret knowledge. I mean, you have to say the right words in order to move through this. So, you know, whole orthodoxy is kind of Gnostic by that definition. And the idea that it's hidden, that it's not available to all people, um, that's, that's kind of Christian exclusivism. So I think the... Uh, uh, maybe the attribution of Gnosticism to this group was incorrect, but the uh, things that Gnosticism is trying to address, the idea that um, the world is not good and that our home is in another place and that we have to have the secret knowledge to reach it, is counter to what we would want Christianity to be. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the issue of numbers because um, the, the criteria on, on which uh, Irenaeus chose the four gospels was uh, in, a, in our time, we think it was extremely arbitrary. He thought that four was the right number. There were four winds, four corners of the earth, <laughs> four, four beasts in Revelation. You know, he had, he had, this number four was the right number. And interestingly, there were others who were, had already chosen four or five gospels that, that they favored and that were sort of central to their communities. Um, but it was Irenaeus's that, uh, and, and many of them included the same gospels, but not all of them. Some of them included others as well. But I thought that that was wonderful that it was just a four was the right number. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I thought I'd show you. Um, here's, here's Elaine, uh, Elaine Pagel's book, Gnostic Gospels. I have to say, I um, am certainly old enough to remember when this book came out. And um, this book, even in progressive churches, was seen as over the top. That it was lending legitimacy by a religious scholar to, or for early Christians to have bought into this stuff. I mean, it, it, it did not go well in, in a lot of churches that were reading this. Um, okay, I just want to mention that we had a very good class here at Binkley. I don't know if anybody else was in it on the Gnostic Gospels. So I can't remember the teacher either, but uh, she was really good. Good. Uh, the, the Binkley readers read one of her, which was a group that used to exist, uh, read one of her books and it was a big group at that time and everyone loved it except for the people who had been ordained <laughs> they hated uh, it that's odd uh, <laughs> yeah john yeah john uh, john you're muted yeah, no, I'm, book. Um, I'm not saying this in competition but i have a publication called the complete Gospels. There are more Gospels out there than simply the Gnostics. We're talking about the Gnostics now, but I just want us to be aware of that. One of them that I ran across just very recently as a reminder is the Ethiopian Gospel, which is still down in the Ethiopian Church, and as far as we know, is the oldest known illuminated Gospel in existence. There's one copy up in a monastery somewhere, and then that led to others. My, my point being that these variety of Gospels then began to consolidate 
into movements who adopted groupings of gospels, if we could have it that, that pattern and then the legitimizing of a particular set of groupings seems to be a product, and I'm going on a rope here, a product of, in fact, the Roman Western way of thinking. It could not tolerate variety. It had to have the way, and then everything else was measured to it. Now, that's an awful broad statement to make. But if you take a look at music, how it's developed over time, it happens to come out the same way. You have varieties in the fringe that then become consolidated into thin movements like jazz and blues and those sorts of things, and then adopted by the so-called traditional. So when you look now and say, what's the classical music of the 80s? You get an entirely different answer than when you say, what's the classical music in the, let's call it the older traditional way. So this kind of movement that we're seeing is not alien at all to what's happening in the Western culture. Thanks, John. Yeah, um, one thing that I found very interesting was um, what we, we spoke of Irenaeus and um, Irenaeus uh, seemed to feel that they needed unity to protect each other, right? That they weren't, so it, so it was uh, uh, a strength for the community to be working together. Uh, and that continues to be a theme throughout this period, um, both with the uh, uh, Jewish Jesus followers and later on the non-Jewish. Um, so, so that's a, that is important. Um, it was also interesting to me to learn that there are almost no Egyptian uh, texts text of Egyptian origin um, that have been found, even though the Nag Hammadi texts were found in Egypt and as others have been, because as we know, they're well preserved in, in, in the desert climate. Um, and uh, isn't that fascinating that, that, you know, Alexandria was the, was a huge center of Christian thought, um, with both, uh, Origen and Irenaeus, um, coming out of there and many others. Uh, anyone have any more information on that or thoughts about that? Why was that, why was that school of thought, uh, not represented? Bert, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember all the details, but the the largest library in the world was in Alexandria, and it was destroyed at some point. Um, I, I assume this is in the same time period. Okay, so they were just destroyed. They weren't the other... whole library was somehow tragically destroyed. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah, fascinating still because this is Laura, by the way. Um, off the side. Um, it's fascinating still because those um, monasteries in the Nitron Valley operated pretty continuously from the period we're studying now to the present. Um, and that's where a lot of our, uh, the wells that we get the documents out of come from as well. <laughs> so it's fascinating that they don't have any of their own stuff yeah. in those finds. Yeah. John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but several decades ago, I talked to a missionary that had been born in Egypt, by the way, of American parents, and he became a missionary himself. And he made two comments. One was that there were 10 million Arabic speaking Christians that are kind of off the radar screen when in the Western church's eyes. The other comment was that there was a ongoing methodical effort by the by the Muslims, I, I'm not painting them black, I'm just labeling what's doing, to destroy this sort of thing. And he and a group were trying to find and preserve Arabic documents, Arabic Christian documents, let's say. Uh, I helped him, for example, uh, uh, we microfilmed a bunch of stuff at one time because where I worked, we had a microfilming capability. This is before computers. So th there is stuff. They found, for example, a document that was a Bible in a monastery of 
where they found up in the mountain somewhere, you know, one of those kind of deals. But it looks as though the deliberate effort to destroy it, that if there are some stuff and it's in a strong Muslim country, nobody's going to talk about it. Nobody's going to bring it up. Thanks. Um, I have a couple of comments. Um, thank you, John. I'm interesting that you have all this background. Um, so uh, the author of the book, I mean, the, there's many authors, I think, of this book, but um, they have a... Um, they have a, a kind of narrative of their own. And then when something is missing, then they say that that was sinister and it was intentionally repressed. And I, I, I'm not sure it was that uh, intentional that certain manuscripts uh, survived and certain, certain didn't. But also my, again, I had a, a professor named Schubert Ogden who was a, uh, you know, he has an incredible intellect, and he argued that um, that of the various Gospels, that if you take the idea that it's a historical religion, that these are most our best sources of um, that we have of the historical Jesus. Now, I don't know how you, that squares with John because John is so different from the other three Gospels. So I don't know. I, I don't want to form an opinion about that, but I mean, I don't have the uh, background to form a definite opinion about that, but, uh, you know, maybe these gospels that were chosen are the ones that are, give us the clearest record of the historical Jesus, even though there was a lot that wasn't the historical Jesus. Right. Okay. Anyone else? We'll go back to, to the slides then. Oh, Meredith, go ahead. I, I'm slow to take things in, so I'm just now taking in what um, Herman said, and it seems it, it touches a lot of thoughts in my mind that what you just said, Herman, that whether or not the, the Gospels that are the canonical Gospels are the best source for the historical evidence of Jesus, they give us a history that we, you didn't say these words, but I think that we claim, and then we have to do something with it. <laughs> some of it we say, no, too fanciful. Uh, some of it we say, I don't understand that yet. Um, but it, it, it gives us a story. I'm, I may be stretching mm -hmm. what you said, but it gave me a lot to oh, think about. It was a story. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and it leads me to think that the, the idea of the search for the historical Jesus mm. was a very strong motivation in um, historical critical research in, in the 19th century when the historical critical method became mm -hmm. more widespread. And then with Albert Schweitzer's book, um, I don't know when it was exactly, uh, maybe around the turn of the century, the no. search for the historical Jesus. Maybe you know Herman. Uh, that was no. a profound attempt. What? He was a scholar. And um, but then um it seems like that whole idea of being able to use documentation and research to find the historical Jesus kind of reached its apex in some books that were published in the 1990s. Um I have one by E.P. Sanders, which is my go-to book. Uh, and then this group, this West Star uh, group, kind of took that on and saying, we're, we're going to find even more layers of the historical Jesus. I, mm -hmm. I myself think what I'm looking for is believable. And it means what I can take in, what I can make sense of, what I can use. I'm talking too much. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to read scholars whose research I have confidence in to tell me things like, what, was, what were Jewish thoughts of the Messiah at the time of Jesus, for instance? But what I carry with me, what I... 
what the community of church helps me with is what I can take in and work with as the story of Jesus. That's enough for me. <laughs> well, I bet, and that's that's great because I I hope um, you know that's the thought in the back of my mind too. Does it make any difference as we you know dig a little deeper? I think um, you know how does it how does it affect um, our faith, which is different um, from our understanding of the of the history. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, it is very different. So I think that's very important and something to think about. And I hope that we'll talk more about that next time. So I hope you'll, you'll all think about that and see um, it, what, what were the shifts, if there were any, um, what did this do? I think these authors are saying over time, we lump things together and we lose the particularity of the teachings. And in doing that, um, we lose a lot. So, um, you know, the, the, I think the encouragement is to go back and perhaps see something different. And as we all know, if, you know, if we've read books, you know, with time spans in between of five to 10 years, we go back and we see something very different often, I, I do. Uh, so uh, I think that, that that is the challenge here. I think, too, that they're pointing out that the tendency was there from the beginning. Um, the authors, I think it was these authors, point out that um, very soon after the four Gospels identified by Irenaeus and, and others, um, came out that they started making a single narrative out of them, right? They were no longer individual, but they made all the stories work together, even though there were differences. And then, you know, we found um, as uh, particularly in the last century and, and uh, that this, this critical awareness of the historical Jesus and people started saying, yeah, I don't believe that these are not the same, right? As, as if, as if we were discovering that for the first time. And as I think we've already talked about, um, you know, the people at the time pulling these stories together did not think they were the same. Right. And in fact, um, despite the fact that they're weaving them together or some are weaving them together all the time, the diversity is actually to bring different groups together, right? They allowed the, 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 the diversity in um, those four gospels and in the Pauline epistles um, to exist so they could bring people in. So I, I think that's, that's important, too. Um, there are lots of things um, going on here. John. Mm -hmm. We in the Western world focus so much on what we call historical fact. You know, this happened on this day, that happened on the other and the other one. <clears throat> it appears to me one of the things that we're missing is these are stories, these are reports because stories has a bad implication in the Western world. Let's call it a report of the experience that people had with the living Lord. And they were not really focused on what he had for lunch. They were focused on a different kind of thing, telling them, I really love, I really respond. Let me tell you about this person who means so much to me. Now, if you take that model and think nowadays, Tell me about your best friend. It's possible that it'll be well into the conversation before I even know what that person looks like, because you'll be telling me about the things you do together and how you respond to each other. Now, if I have two people telling me about a common friend, I expect some variety. I expect that relationship to have some variety, but I also expect now I'm building a picture of this common friend. And that may help in thinking about some of this. I don't think the Gospels were intended to be what we would call historically, factually 
accurate. They weren't looking at the events of the day as much as the meaning and the relationship and the concepts of the events. What does it mean that the kingdom of God is here? I don't even know what Jesus wore. I don't know. What was his favorite color? You know, all those kinds of things. What was his favorite food? But these other things that come out into it. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I meant to start on a different sense, and I guess it's important to clarify it. Um, so we know that the parables are the best uh, record of um, how Jesus taught. But the, um, you know, Mark is very sketchy. He doesn't really have the resurrection in his story. Um, Luke has the Jesus of justice and care, uh, concern for the poor. Matthew is trying to uh, map the Jesus story against the Hebrew against the Hebrew prophecies, and John is about the you know the post resurrection Jesus, the the Christ. So these are these are experiences within the within the Christian community, but they all relate back to, and this is the scandal, really, isn't it? Um, that they somehow relate back to this historical figure. Uh, so I don't mean it's a it's a factual record in the in the sense that we would talk about reporting on facts today. I think that you're right. Um, that's the way I understand the four gospels. And Kate, are you, are you going to talk about Paul this morning? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, let's get to that because I think that's so interesting uh, about. Uh, what Paul wrote and then what the, the pseudo Pauline gospel uh, letters were about. And, uh, you know, John Cobb, who's another friend of mine, um, said there isn't just one Christianity, there's multiple Christianities. And I think he means that over time. And I think he means it, you know, today. And I think he meant it early on that there's always been multiple Christianities. You know, and I wonder, <laughs> Anyone who comes into Christianity knew they must scratch their head because there's it's not consistent. It just isn't consistent. Right. Right. Okay. Let's go here. Okay. That's Elaine. Okay. I think we've covered this. So we 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 will move on. Um that the authors really don't like these being called uh, Gnostic um, and, and they don't like the uh, use of Gnostic to mean heresy, which it has come to mean to some people. Okay, we did that. Turning to Paul. Okay. Um, this is um, from our authors. And what they're saying is that given the uh, dominance of, of Paul as a single author in the New Testament, um, you would think that he was very influential during his lifetime and certainly in the uh, years afterward as the uh, church, uh, different, different uh, identities, beliefs about Jesus's life were uh, being considered. Um, they say though that Paul's own letters show that he struggled to find an audience and had trouble holding on to supporters. Um, he was quarrelsome, as anyone reading Paul um, knows. And that Paul is not quoted wild, widely. There's no indication that he, his presence was important in uh, many of the communities uh, for whom records are available. Um, but then, let's say nearly 100 years after his death in the second mid-century, he began to be name-checked by an aggressive group of partisans who had rediscovered his legacy. But others reacted with either hostility or with relative indifference to this obscure character. 
Now, I want to share this exchange with you that I, I had on, on this point, because I had always taken Bart Ehrman's um, writings as placing great emphasis on Paul as being very influential in the early centuries. So I undertook uh, a little email, or it was actually on, on his blog, exchange um, with him, asking him if he had read the book um, and his assessment of it, if he had. And um, particularly, I was wondering um, that about the statement of the authors that most second century writings by those belonging to communities of the anointed do not mention Paul. And I just wanted to share with you, I just, it was kind of an interesting exchange. He writes back, he didn't read it. Generally, I think the scholars at West Star are very smart and almost always I think they are very wrong. Uh, it, it, yeah, you, those of you who've heard him speak probably can hear how he would say that. Uh, it's true in this case that most second century writings don't mention Paul. They don't mention Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John either. So, well, if you do want to pursue this issue, my former student, Benjamin White, who wrote a book showing that early Christians were deeply influenced by Paul, contrary to this uh, older view, which these fellows seem to be accepting, that Paul was the apostle of heretics and therefore shunned by the proto-Orthodox, which is, you know, uh, kind of interesting that that was his response, uh, was to me anyway. Um, and I wrote back that they, these authors were not suggesting that he was the apostle of heretics, at least not as I read it, but that there was a great variety in beliefs and communities uh, than one would be led to believe from the focus on Paul's writings throughout the subsequent centuries and, of course, his representation in the New Testament. And then he writes back, yes, they wouldn't use the term heresies, but the varieties they are referring to were called in the ancient sources themselves, heresies. This, you may know, has been one of my dominant interests over the years, the varieties of early Christianity. And of course, um, it is uh, a focus of his, his work. So um, I did notice though that a lot of this is, um, first of all, I, I thought it was interesting that he associated um, uh, this group um, with those who would call um, Paul a heretic. Um, I don't know where that comes from, but I'm sure he has a reason for that. Um, but on his blog, despite his saying that he was very influential in the early centuries, he says that Paul was important, but not that important. And he does not think that Paul was the founder of Christianity due to the emphasis in later uh, orthodoxy on uh, Jesus's death and resurrection. So uh, that just, I thought was interesting to see where scholarship uh, focuses uh, at this time. And um, I just thought at, at this point, rather than go into specific things about uh, Paul, that I let you talk about Paul, um, what you think about his role in early and later Christianity. Um, and uh, anything that you've uh, come away with thus far on the foundational beginnings of what we would recognize as Christian belief. And anything you know about why people in the uh, early uh, Jesus groups felt a need to either support or oppose Paul. Um, do you have any... Anyone have thoughts on this? I'm having a hard time finding my cursor again. Okay. Anyone want to speak? Uh, Kate, um, one thing I read, I just hadn't known any of this business about Paul, but I was kind of really glad to um, hear it since I'm not a big fan of Paul's. Um, but that he had established churches 
in the Gentile world and that they needed a an entree into that or an inc- so a way of including uh, what was becoming a, not just totally an Israeli I- Israelite um, religion. Okay, so so are you saying that uh, Paul's writings were a way um, to bring others, other Gentiles, in to show them that that he was in in dialogue with other Gentile communities? Is that what you're saying? I thought the author seemed to say that. Okay, uh, I'm not sure. I'm, and following the same point, but the authors did say that after this war, um, that the um, the Jewish community was um, was uh, in great stress, and that the uh, the churches outside the uh, Jewish areas uh, became more important. And Paul had had um, worked in that area, and it kind of gravitated toward uh, Paul. And I think that, um, I mean, it's not unusual for people uh, to not like Paul, but I think if you distinguish between the Pauline letters and the pseudo-Pauline letters, you get a different picture. And for, well, I, I agree that he didn't found a church. I mean, there was this, this movement that was going on. He's probably been more influential than any other writer that in inventing Christianity, you know, the Lord's Supper and, and other things that uh, that we bring into our into our worship and in our own tradition that we're saved by grace, not works. Um, so this and, and I did hear Bart Ehrman uh, at um, a bookshop talk about the pseudo Pauline letters, and he said it was very unusual for people to. Uh, to do that, to insinuate that these were written by somebody that they were actually written by. And of course, he was very critical of that. He kind of, um, he, he kind of, he, he has a kind of um, chip on his shoulder about Christianity, I think. Um, but um, yeah, it, it probably was, maybe it was a little bit unusual that this is the way it developed in the church. And I think the explanation they give here that can, that uh, bringing it more into convention with, um, you know, conventional standards was what was going on in those pseudo Pauline letters. Bringing Paul into more conventional standards. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting that you say that uh, Bart Ehrman has that view on it being unusual. I thought he didn't think it was unusual. And if it wasn't him, then it, it someone else that I've um, encountered along the way said that it was not uncommon uh, for people to, particularly people in the movement, they're basically borrowing the authority. I mean, doing the obvious, right? Borrowing the authority of, of the major voice uh, in the, in the, in the movement. So. Yeah. I can't recall if he said that this was um, um, unusual because it was, just the Pauline letters, or if it was unusual because the Christian churches did this, and it wasn't usual in the Roman world for people to do this. I I can't say. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to speak to Paul from, from, from this perspective? I mean, there's Paul's a subject in and of himself, of course. Um, But um, yeah, Meredith. I have a sort of off the cuff um, approach to Paul uh, when I have the energy to read through and kind of discard some of the fixed positions that make me itchy in Paul. But I remember um, once asking uh, my father when he was working on um, translation of um, the Pauline material of what he was going to do that day. He always had his work laid out for the day. And he said, I can't remember which letter of Paul he was working on. He said, I'm, I'm dealing with Paul arguing with himself. <laughs> and that was so uh, heartening to me that maybe that's one of my difficulties in reading Paul is not following where it is that he's fussing with his 
older thinking mm. and trying to push himself maybe too hard towards new thinking. It was just a helpful insight. So I pass that on. <laughs> John? Paul is somewhat of a loose cannon. If you take a look at the setup there, the church in Jerusalem under James apparently felt some responsibility to be the carrier of the word, let's call it, or the organizer of what was going on. And Paul is kind of like a guy with a red mega hat suddenly showing up at a progressive meeting, saying mm -hmm. the word has come to me, throwing his hat off, and then going around shooting his mouth off about how everybody else how to operate. What's worse than that is he's right a lot of the times. Like when he calls Peter's hand on Peter's somewhat paradoxical behavior about eating. So th th there's some things about Paul that are really disturbing. And I begin to wonder if that's really the role that he had was to keep things stirred up. Not that he thought his role was that way. But what he really did was keep things stirred up and, and try to, uh, let's say, um, help out people who were stuck. Let's put it that way, these different congregations. I have heard people espouse that it's, you ought to call it Paulianity, not Christianity, because it's really based on what Paul thought. I think that's gone a little far, but he had a heck of an impact. Tremendous. Yeah. Tremendous. I gotta go to Clara. Oh, thank you, Herman. Um, well, I, I, I think it's. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting that that uh, Ehrman thought that uh, the West Star uh, Institute people might be into uh, calling Paul a heretic, and I think that that may reflect um, certainly what has been. Um, a reaction of uh, particularly some more progressive people uh, to reading uh, Paul, um, if I may say in some sense, fairly literally and rejecting it, right? And not, not putting it in historical context. I mean, you know, everybody's guilty of that to some extent or another. So I don't think we should uh, be surprised that, that, that we do that too. But I think, you know, uh, that there are those who dismiss Paul too rapidly and, and that he, it seemed to me that he was putting uh, this group uh, among those who would do that. Um, you know, as, as the authors of this book say, um, he does get an awful lot of print for <laughs> what is known about him and what is known about his influence from everything that they have. You know, I mean, from the texts, from uh, letters, from historians of the time to archaeology, um, Paul did not seem to have that great an influence in the, you know, during his lifetime and after his death. Certainly his writings did not. Um, so uh, he was found and he was found to, by Meredith, he was found to have something to offer to those who, who wanted to bring together uh, this proto-orthodoxy, as uh, Ehrman calls it, the, early, the earliest glimpses of those who are trying to bring groups together with some set of beliefs that, um, that they might be able to agree with. Uh, so... Um, I'll just, uh, I'll leave that there where people are, are, are needing to go. We're supposed to be wrapping up around 1030. Uh, unless you all have any, any final thoughts for today, we're going to read through the end of the book uh, for our last session together next week. No? Everyone good? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.